Welcome to the final session of uh, today's program here uh, in the press room. Um, it's uh, going to be a special one uh, since we as the Zero Project have uh, produced uh, a, a documentary together with a great team that I'm going to introduce you uh, in, a, in a few moments. It's a, it's, a, it's, a prem it's a documentary and it's a premiere uh, and it's called How to Drive a Formula One Car with Your Thoughts. I'm having great people together with me uh, in, this, uh, in this session. All of me are virtually with, with, with us here, uh, except myself. I'm sitting in the, in the room here in, in Vienna uh, in the United Nations building. The people here with us in this next hour are uh, Mallory Regiman, who is an American Paralympic swimmer and gold medalist, uh, and is, uh, if I'm correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mallory, uh, is part of the NBC moderator team covering the Paralympics team. And as you can see on the screen, uh, the, the next person I'm going to introduce is, uh, is her husband. Uh, it's uh, uh, Jeremy J. Snyder. Uh, he is the uh, co-CEO and co-founder of uh, TFA, uh, productions, which is uh, the producer of this documentary. Then we have with us here the star of the documentary, uh, which is uh, Rodrigo Mendes Hübner. Uh, Rodrigo is the founder of the Rodrigo Mendes Institute, uh, which is um, an institution focusing on uh, education and technology. We have with us Tan Li, who is um, an entrepreneur uh, and who has developed uh, this technology that is used uh, to steer this Formula Yam One car. Uh, with your thoughts, uh, the company is called Emotive Neurotech and it's based in the United States. And finally, we have with us Hasim Abdelkawi. He works for Toyota Ru Europe uh, and he's in this team uh, that works for Toyota on the mobility and accessibility strategy. So, without any further ado, I suggest we watch the video uh, together and then we take it from there. I am Rodrigo Rubiner Mendes, the CEO of Rodrigo Mendes Institute. I'm Tan Lee, founder and CEO of Emotive. I wanted to create new technologies that would allow us to measure the brain so that we can start to build models that allow us to understand how the brain functions across all of the diverse ways that the brain is used every single day throughout all of the facets of, of life. Being able to control devices in our homes and to being able to communicate more independently and have a, a tremendous power of giving more life quality to, to all the segment of, of people with disabilities. When I was finishing high school uh, and preparing myself to enter uh, the medical school, I went through a car robbery. Uh, I was leaving my home when two armed robbers approached me and shot me through the neck. And the consequence was the paralysis below my shoulder. But luckily I had the best support someone can get from physicians, family and friends. So nowadays I run an institute that is focused on guaranteeing that every child with a disability can have access to quality education at mainstream schools that we call inclusive education. When I was a child, every Sunday we had a moment of watching the race car. Some years ago, I received a call from TV Global uh, inviting me to participate in a high-tech project. Their goal was to allow a paralyzed person to drive a car using his mind. At its surface, we can start to restore function. We can start to help people who have been impacted by injury or have certain neurological conditions. And so that's the first aspect where neurotechnology can can have a very transformative impact on a person's life. But neurotechnology can also go beyond just restoring function. It can also pave the way for actual human enhancement. I was supposed to be the consultant of the project and 
uh, I went to a meeting with the project directors. And, and after they heard that the last thing I did before being shot was to drive a car, they immediately decided that I had to be the pilot. So that's how this, this amazing experience began. I went to a racetrack where a team with more than 100 people were waiting for me. When I realized I was inside a race car that had no pedals and no steering wheel, and I was wearing a helmet specially designed for me to drive with my thought. The project team used a brain-computer interface produced by Emotive, and this device had electrodes that capture the brain electricity and allow us uh, to associate a certain thought or a certain brain pattern with a specific command. In order to accelerate, I thought about celebrating a soccer goal, which refers to vision. To turn right, I thought about eating a delicious meal, which relates to tasting. And to turn left, I thought about holding a bicycle handlebar, which refers to touch. Interestingly, this uh, opportunity was something that was created independently of us in many respects. I only found out about it after Rodrigo had had that moment around the race car. We were part of the World Economic Forum community called the Young Global Leaders. And I happened to be sitting across the table from Rodrigo, not knowing that he had had this experience with our technology. The project brings us to important message. First, it, it highlights the importance of technology in the search uh, for the elimination of barriers. And second, the, the project also gives us an opportunity to remember that technology by itself is not enough to promote an inclusive society. They have to do with our attitudes, with our judgments, and and our limitations in dealing with human differences. I feel that this technology has tremendous potential around that, that axis of, of access and inclusion um, and to really celebrate life. This technology allows us to, to really do all of that, right? It allows us to celebrate our differences. It allows us to, to be more resilient. When you can do something like that with technology, when you can use that to enhance the human experience, I think that's that's technology executed in the best possible way. Yeah, wow. So thanks uh, to everyone involved in that. And um, I'm honored and pleased also that the Zero Project here could uh, play a convening role in bringing um, all of these uh, great people together to produce this documentary. So uh, a great thank you to everyone involved in that. But it's not only a great documentary for the purpose of producing a documentary. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, a part of the Zero Project idea of promoting accessibility. And this session is about uh, more a visionary approach. So what the future might bring, what maybe in five or ten years' time uh, will hopefully be a, a product of the shelf and the service. Uh, off the shelf, and this is what we are going to discuss uh, in this session. So the the way we are going to do it, uh, the running order will be that I'm first uh, asking uh, Jeremy and Mallory about uh, their experience, their background, uh, their learnings from this documentary, uh, and uh, ask them first to also introduce themselves and give us a little more background. Uh, the, the, the quality and the insights of the producers have definitely uh, added what's, what was necessary to, uh, to produce that. We will follow up with uh, Rodrigo and ask him about his experience uh, and his, 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 his perspective on, on is this the future or, or not, and what would, what would be needed so that it becomes uh, the future. We then move on to, to Tan Le, who will give us an insight on the technology that is used, how this works, how this could develop into this into the future, and we're going to end up with Hasim uh, from Toyota, who gives us 
let's say the, uh, the the grounding again and uh, and the puts our feet together back on the on the ground and uh, and tells us uh, how a, a mainstream uh, motor producer like Toyota sees it and where this is embedded in the in the future accessibility and mobility strategy of Toyota. So then over to you, uh, Jeremy and Mallory. Uh, so I suggest you start uh, by um, uh, introducing yourself briefly and then uh, have a discussion between yourselves and me uh, how this uh, came upon, uh, how you approached this, what your learnings and your experiences were when you produced it. You are experienced in that field. You're doing this similar kind of documentations all the time, but uh, I trust and hope it was also for you something special. So Mallory and, and Jeremy, over to you. Well, thank you so much. It's been an honor to uh, to work with you and, and share the story with the world. I'm Jay Snyder. I'm a co-CEO and executive producer at TFA Group, a social impact agency and production studio. And this is my partner in life. She's also my wife, but a partner in business as well. And I'm Mallory Wegman. I am the other part of the co-CEO for TFA Group. And as he said, his wife. And I'm also a three-time Paralympic swimmer for Team USA. And so... You know, I think for Jay and I, we our passion really comes in in utilizing the power of sport and media and where they intersect to change perception of disability in our society and really spark that conversation. We talk a lot about the fact that in the disability community here domestically in the U.S., but worldwide, we all have one fundamental desire, and that is to have equal access to the human experience. And so our question that we ask ourselves every day is how do we play a part in, in being a part of that solution? And for us, media is a big piece of this because as you see, we have the opportunity to highlight remarkable stories, but in that we are able to spark a conversation about how technology can really serve as a catalyst to create a more inclusive society for all. Jeremy, you want to maybe give us one or two more insights on, on how you did this production? It was uh, during COVID time, so it was also not so easy to produce. No, no it, was a, it was a unique production, to say the least. I think we were envisioning being able to be in person in San Francisco uh, with Tan and, and Rodrigo to, to bring this all to life. And the recent surge uh, made us adapt. And I think we're all used to that over the last two years. And, and uh, we adapted and, and quickly pulled this remote production uh, in Brazil and in San Francisco. And Mallory had the honor of uh, virtually interviewing both Tan and Rodrigo a couple weeks ago and pulling this video together. So for us, it was a it was a unique challenge, but we were up to the challenge and wanting to share this story, uh, as Mallory mentioned, to spark that conversation. I think for us, utilizing this story to hopefully also change that perception of disability in our society and what viewers who may not have seen this or been aware of a motive or Rodrigo's story or the ability to drive an F1 car with your own thoughts, it's pun intended, mind blowing. I think people <laughs> people literally are watching it and we've shared it with our own network and it just, it exposes them to something they would not have been exposed to. And that's what's so invigorating about what we get to do. Yeah, it was a, um, pulling that production together was was very special for for a lot of reasons for us and and I had a moment when when speaking with Rodrigo where I realized that him and I share some some personal elements that are fairly close in the fact that we were both injured at the same age in our life and then speaking with Tan and and just hearing about neuroscience and technology and as I just said earlier I mean it's that human desire and that we just have fundamentally ingrained in all of us to have equal access to that experience, whatever it is. And so to see what Rodrigo was able to do utilizing emotive technology just opens the door for the conversation of what else can we utilize technology to do to create more access and in, in a more inclusive society for all. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Jay, for, uh, and um, from my side also, thank you for this great partnership that we have also developed in the production of that. Um, over to you, Rodrigo. So uh, we saw a lot of your experiences and of your emotion already uh, in, in the video, but um, I think there's more to it. Uh, so um, what, what can you tell us on top of that? Uh, I remember we had some uh, conversations also about some plans of, of yours taking this into the future and uh, and the, the the direct Formula One connection that you might want to mention. 
Yeah, hi Michael, Tan, uh, Jay, Mallory, uh, Hassin, and, and all friends from, from Zero Project. Mm, always a pleasure to participate in this magnificent conference that have been, I can say, spreading a, a powerful message of equality around the world uh, over the last years. Well, Michael, many things to share. So, so going straight to the point, I first, I never had so much fear in my life. The, the engine was very, very powerful and, and the car jumped like a horse. So uh, after starting, uh, I had a, a long straight ahead and, and the first turn was to the left. And I think that was the first big test. If the car didn't turn, God knows how big the, the impact would be. Uh, so I, I just before the end of, of the straight, I, I stopped thinking about the first command, which was, uh, as, I, as I told in, in the video, the, the celebration of a soccer goal. And I started thinking about the, the bicycle handboard, the second command I trained for. And, and the car slowed down, but it started to turn before the, the, the point. So <laughs> I ended up going a little off the edge of the track, uh, but, but I completed the, the turn. And then uh, I went straight ahead and, and on the second, on the next curve, uh, I broke into the gravel trap and, and the car's engine died. But, but I moved forward, uh, a bit bumpy, but I did, uh, until the third lap, when, when I really started uh, uh, feeling that I had the control of the car. It, it's a pity that the experience was so short, uh, but, well, taking advantage of the fact that Toyota is here with us, represented by Hassin. <laughs> Who knows, Hassin, in the near future, we will have the this available to, to anyone, yeah? Yeah, thank you, Rodrigo. Um, um, just one additional question. In um, We had uh, several conversations before, and in one of them, you also showed me this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, brief meeting with Lewis Hamilton and, uh, and the bet against him. No? Uh, so can you share this uh, again with us? Ah, okay. Yeah. Michael, that happened one year after uh, that, that shooting. I went to Dubai. Uh, I, was, I was a speaker in an education conference. And, and during that conference, I... I uh, I was informed that Lewis Hamilton was at, at that hotel because he was going to be uh, the, the surprise of the final of the final scene when when many teachers would receive a, a important prize. So uh, a friend of us uh, took me to the press conference and, and, and they put me in the first line. Uh, of the audience. So after after uh, talking to the interviewer and, and sharing his story and so on, uh, the the leader of that event, which is a friend of us, uh, said, "Well, Hamilton, I would like to <laughs> to pass the mic to the to the audience, starting by Rodrigo, who had just experienced a very unique." Uh, opportunity and uh, maybe you had heard he, 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 uh, he has driven a Formula One car with his thoughts and so on. Well, then the mic came to me and, and there were like 30, 30 uh, important media uh, journalists, all, everyone looking at me and I thought, what can I say to, to Lewis Hamilton after so many, <laughs> so many uh, interesting things he, he explained? Well, then I just, I just uh, said, well, Hamilton, was great pleasure. You know that uh, the Brazilian pilots are, are famous, famous of being good, good professionals. So don't get me wrong, but I, I would love to challenge you to, to race against me sometime. Was kidding. Uh, but, but he answered immediately, yes, let's do it. And, at, and on the next day, like 100 portals of about Formula One was communicating that 
Lewis Hamilton accepted to run against me. So that that was 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 that was what happened, Michael. Yeah. So uh, since he prolonged his career, uh, we you should come back to him at some point and uh, and uh, and ask him that it's the time now to do it. Um, Tan, over to you. So uh, it's your technology that Rodrigo was using uh, when he uh, drove this Formula One car. Formula One car. So um, could you give us a background of w what your organization is, what your technology is, and what you're what you're up to? Yeah, Michael, you know, I have to say that this is such an incredible experience to see the documentary um, and that storytelling come to life and then to hear Rodrigo's narration of what he experienced uh, in, in that moment as he went through the turns is just really, really incredible. Um, as the founder and CEO of a company that is trying to advance understanding of the human brain through uh, electroencephalography or EEG for short, you know, we're looking at ways to measure the brain in context. So the brain is made up of billions of neurons. And when you, when these neurons interact with each other, there's a chemical reaction that takes place that emits an electrical impulse. And what we're able to do is that we can measure these voltage fluctuations non-invasively at the surface of the scalp in order to start to analyze how these patterns basically change in order to derive models that allow us to kind of discern different types of insights, different cognitive states, different mental states. We're not reading your mind, so we're a very long way from being able to read your mind. Think about um, a football stadium for an, uh, for an analog, right? If we had microphones all around the stadium, we can't zone into an individual conversation between two you know, individuals in that stadium, but we can see when a goal, uh, you know, someone hits, shoots a goal, we can see whose side the ball is with because, you know, they're making noise. We can see if the audience is doing a Mexican wave. Those are things that we can see, but we can't go down to the granularity. But that alone provides us with a lot of information already about the dynamics of the system. And that's a window into the human brain that we otherwise wouldn't have. And what's really exciting about this technology is that we're making it easier and easier for everyday people to access. We've taken the technology, you know, when I first started in this space, the technology was in the tens of thousands of dollars and we've taken it down to less than, you know, a, it's just a few hundred dollars. So anyone can afford one of these devices. And so one of the core goals at Emotive is to democratize access to this technology, because we believe that by democratizing access to technology, by enabling more people to get their hands on it and to shape where this technology can go, we can usher in a revolution in terms of how we can understand and interface with the human brain in ways that we never thought would be possible before. So it's a very exciting frontier. That's what we're trying to pave. And, you know, a big, big thanks to Rodrigo, to Jay uh, and Mallory and to the Zero Project for bringing this to life um, because I think it's so important for, for us to, on the one hand, you know, understand like as technologists, we work on the technology every day, but to bring it to life in a way that's really transformative um, and, and touches people's hearts, that's when, you know, I, I think technology, you know, you really breathe life to it in a way that captivates people's imagination and fires their heart as to the possibilities. And I think that's, that makes me very excited and inspired. Uh, Tan, this is extremely exciting. Um, you said you have brought the price down f to that. Uh, where, do, Which products and services would you see have currently the biggest potential that it will become uh, products and services off the shelf, so at least mainstream usage? Is this accessibility, disability at all, or is this something else? So where are you heading? Where do you see the biggest potential currently? Yeah. Yeah. Michael, I think that's a really great question. So we um, are creating a technology platform that covers the 
many, many different modalities of how we measure the brain using electroencephalography. So for the, the system that Rodrigo was using is a 14 channel system. We have a 32 channel system and you probably see with her scenes, uh, stuff is not using emotive tech, but there are some more elaborate systems that give you more high resolution, high fidelity. So we have a 32 channel system. We also have a five channel system, but what I'm really excited about is our latest two channel system. It's a more narrow use case, but it's embedded in headphones. And so you can imagine a technology that takes this format where everyone can actually wear one, right? So you you don't look like you're wearing a spine on your head for lack of another description, right? Uh, you, you don't look unusual. You're just like every other person walking around with a pair of headphones. But now with the advancements in sensing technology, with the advances in machine learning and computing power, we can bring the technology into a form factor that everyday people can use and consume to understand their, their cognitive states. You know, we'll see this in homes, in everyday life, in learning applications, in some limited uh, use cases for, for commands, the mental commands, uh, will be very limited, it will be rudimentary, but it's a starting point that will allow us to democratize access to this technology and bring it into everyday use cases. And I think that's where it's really exciting, while at the same time, with all of these other form factors, we will continue to advance the science. And that's where it's really exciting with a large scale machine learning model, a data model that allows us to look at data at all of these different dimensionality and permutations, we can start to build models that will become more sophisticated, that will access many, many more use cases because the human brain is used in every single facet of our life, whether we're sleeping, whether we're interacting with friends, whether we're studying, we're, you know, going out and driving a car, whatever it is that we're doing, it's going to involve the human in some, and the brain in some capacity. And, and whether you're able-bodied, where you, whether you have a neurological impairment, as long as your brain is still intact, there's a chance that we can tap into it and give you an opportunity to have that access, to normalize that experience, to give you, extend your autonomy, give you more independence. And I think that's where the magic of this, ha this technology can, can happen. And so we're very excited about the form factor, the evolution of the technology, the enablement that's being um, that's been made possible through uh, large-scale data and the advancements in machine learning that we can now generate uh, on our, our data. And I'm excited by what Haseem's going to be sharing because we're seeing companies, real large corporations, take on this technology in a meaningful way to explore how it can be used in in, in ways that will impact you know, a billion people in, in, in the next few years, which is really, really exciting. Um, Tan, before I'm moving over to Hasim, there's one more question that I have to ask you. How, what's your background? What's your development? How did you, uh, you're the entrepreneur behind Emotive. How, how did that happen? So I, in 2003, I had just sold my company in um, uh, telecommunication technology. So it was a middleware platform for telcos. And I was looking around to decide what I would do next with my life. I had been a lawyer. I had been a, neuro, uh, a telecommunications entrepreneur. And I said, I am done with these five-year, six-year stints. <laughs> uh, I, I really want to invest my time and energy and a, into a lifelong endeavor. And I wanted to find a, an area that was sufficiently greenfield that would captivate my imagination um, and my passion for decades. I wanted something that I could really, really spend time on. And I, you know what? Once I started on the brain, it has been a never-ending journey because it gets harder and harder every day. The every, at every inflection point, you see a new opportunity, a new advancement that you didn't know before because we are only just scratching the surface. So, um, yeah, it's really exciting. I've been in this field now for it'll be 20 years next year. So it's a long time uh, to be working in this field by now. But um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's it's definitely kept me going for, for two decades already and hopefully many more. Thank you, Tan. 
No, over to you, Hasim. Uh, so let's hear now the perspective of a, of a, of a I think, if, I don't know if it's the biggest, but definitely one of the biggest motor companies in the world. What, what's your approach on, uh, on, on accessibility and, uh, uh, and, and mobility? Over to you, Hasim. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I prepared it. Okay, so actually, um, um, hello everybody. I'm, I'm Hazem Abdelkawi. I'm a senior engineer in, in Toyota Motor Europe. Um, I'm really glad to join you today to share our progress in, in integrating advanced neuroscience uh, with different mobility services to deliver better mobility for all. Um, next slide, please. Actually, in fact, Toyota is now in the transformation process from a car manufacturer company to a mobility company, which aim to deliver ever better mobility services for all people with zero barriers, actually. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Toyota started to work closely with the International Olympic and Paralympic Committees uh, through to 2024 20, uh, to provide sustainable mobility solutions for the Games to help uh, with safer and more efficient mobility, including intelligent transportation systems, urban traffic systems, and vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication system. Uh, next slide, please. And for example, here, uh, there is like the e-pallet and accessible people uh, mover and uh, um, actually walking area PEV, which are low speed and short distance battery based electric vehicle, uh, which is suitable for transportation of visitors. Beside that, as you can see here, there is a human support robot, which can provide cognitive and physical support for dependent people. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is really amazing, but actually to deliver more human-centric uh, mobility services, we should think about creating more intelligent machines by including human brains in the loop. And by doing this integration, we can create more emotional intelligent machine. And this is, will enable the machine to understand human desires and anticipating their intentions and providing more proactive assistive services, actually. Uh, next slide, please. And towards this goal, actually, in Team E, we started to develop a, a new uh, artificial intelligent models to decode uh, human brain signals to select an option like a call or, or a radio, or even to open an option from the HMI screen, but without touching the HMI screen, actually, just by thinking. And, and to validate that, uh, that models, actually, we did our first real-world driving experiment in, in, in the driving um, uh, uh, track, as you can see here. And actually, we, we, we got a very nice uh, validation performance in this experiment. Uh, next slide, please. This is, was actually the first driving experiment that we did. Um, the, second, uh, the second experiment that we did is to how to control a robotic action, uh, uh, the human support robot actions actually only by thinking, and that can be achieved by integrating and transmitting the human brain signals to the robot, and the robot can actually translate those uh, uh, signals into a specific actions. There is a video here, so um, can you open the video, please? Or if it's not, uh, can I share my screen just to show you the video? Okay, it's not I'm possible. Going yeah. to... Okay, okay, I I'm going to share my screen. Uh, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so this is myself actually here. And no, now uh... we cannot. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Now we can. The, okay, video, the, the video is on now, so you could give it a try. Okay. So uh, actually, uh, I did the experiment. I was in Brussels, and I was wearing the helmet to read my brain signals. And the robot uh, was in Parma, in Italy. And we transmitted the brain signals over the internet communication. And we, uh, we, ha we had a successful experiment by controlling the robot in, in Parma, in Italy. And I was in Brussels. And this was like uh, the first human brain 
communication between a uh, human and a robot overseas in two different countries. Um, yeah, so this is actually the second experiment uh, that we did. And uh, to achieve actually uh, um, uh, zero barriers, uh, like any kind of barriers, like social, physical, and mental, uh, we think that mobility for all is essential. And the research in, in, into human brain interfaces is really crucial to achieve inclusive support independent of physical and mental abilities. Uh, we know actually that the road is long, but we believe that this research area is really crucial uh, to have a truly mobility for all society. Yeah, Th thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hasim. That was uh, really impressing. Uh, maybe just one question to follow up, and then I would go uh, over a little discussion on, on technology, then end up with a discussion about the, the human touch again. Um, Hasim, sure. this, this, um, please give us a little background. I think this is all in a kind of experiment stage or pilot stage. Do you expect any of that yes. that you showed us to be uh, a, 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 a real market product soon, or did I get that wrong? Actually, this is like a very early experimental uh, stage, let's say, because uh, it is really complicated to understand human brains, right? And we need time to understand which signals that we can read, which signals that we can interpret, and how can we integrate those signals to achieve and to 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 do some specific tasks, actually, like what uh, Rodrigo just uh, did here. He was thinking about uh, something to control the car to go straight something else to to turn right or turn left so this is really important and this needs actually a long time of training let's say to 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 to, to bring it to to the market so we are trying to discover now the, the let's say the potential of the brain signals to 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 select some options in the car to support some autonomous functionality in, in the car, but this is actually in, in the very early stage of, of research. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Hasim. W one more question. Um, I think your focus of Toyota is uh, is the Olympics and uh, and the Paralympics uh, 2024 in Paris. No? Uh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and um, I, I trust this will be also a showcase of, uh, of your mobility concept for the future. Yeah, actually, we are trying now to integrate some of those, uh, let's say, uh, demos in, in Paris 2024. And that's why we started to investigate those, let's say, potential applications early to, to validate the, the different applications that we can show in Paris 2024. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Tan, uh, back to you. Um, when when you saw this uh, this uh, approach from from Toyota, is this related to what you are working on and developing? Is this something very different? Is this basically the same thing? Or what 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 is your first takeaway from when you look at the Toyota uh, strategy and approach? Uh, yeah, so I think that it's it's um, it's using the same underlying technology, electroencephalography. So it's a very um, non-invasive way to measure the brain. So that, that that's where the commonality exists. In terms of the models, um, it's slightly different. It looks like it's using a, a form of um, evoked potential, um, which is a little different uh, way to train the model than what we're using. Um, so essentially with evoked potentials, you're essentially flashing a, a number of things and just, just depending on the brain's response, which is an involuntary response, it's very distinctive in the brain. You can define that signal and you can see what, what the brain is saying, yes, this is what I, I want and therefore you can use that as a trigger. Whereas with our technology, what we're using is a statistical model that allows the user to train the model uh, in real time. So um, you're actually looking at, um, obviously we can't, uh, we can't read your, brain, your thoughts, but what we, we're looking for is two distinct states um, when you're thinking about a specific action. So Rodrigo can think about, um, you know, moving forward with the soccer goal, he can and then essentially the training happens within a relatively short space of time. So we're updating the models in real time. So for example, for a layman, first person that's never touched the, the equipment before, there's a eight second baseline that we take, which is a neutral state that allows us to calibrate the system. And then we train for eight seconds of one action state, which allows you to have the first action. So it's a relatively short training 
uh, sequence from that standpoint. However, as you add more actions, the performance starts to degrade substantially because the capacity to distinguish between different ideas and distinct thoughts and the person, the individual user's capacity to get back to the same idea is also important in this regard. And so Rodrigo's ability to have a very distinct idea in his mind that's reproducible, that he can go back to in a reliable, repeatable fashion is very, very important in order to re to train the machine learning model because we're building using a statistical basis um, in, and re partial real-time um, algorithm for the individual uh, at the use case. So it is uh, more flexible and more agile, but it also requires a little bit of give and, you know, give and take from the user as well. <laughs> the machine is not that smart, right? It, it's looking for a very specific pattern. Um, it can recognize very, my, very tiny changes in the patterns, but unfortunately it requires the human to be able to come back to that very, very same state. Uh, Tan, an, another question. Um, you're, you're based in California. Um, is the market that you're in, uh, is this a, a, a kind of startup driven market with a lot of uh, money coming from Silicon Valley investors? Is this this kind of market or uh, is it a different market uh, that, that you're in? I trust there's more than one technology in, a, in, 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 an, in, a, in an early development or pilot, uh, a pilot phase. No? So neurotechnology is getting a lot of interest at the moment. One of the big reasons for that is because Elon Musk has announced that he is moving into this field, albeit with a form of invasive technology. Uh, so some many people would have, would have heard of Neuralink. And since Elon Musk has started to announce his participation and interest in this, and since the um, some of the early... Uh, demonstrations that we saw with monkeys last year, there's definitely been a, an uptick in interest in the general uh, area of neurotechnology, but neurotechnology has many dimensions. So we have Elon Musk's Neuralink, which is an invasive technology at one end of the spectrum. Uh, we have something in between, which is Kernel, which is Brian Johnson's company that's looking at a functional near infrared system, still very expensive, but exquisite engineering to really allow you to look at the brain in real time with um, different ways of imaging the brain um, with a good temporal and uh, uh, spatial resolution. And then you have companies like Emotive, which is looking at an, an in, a same sort of goal, which is to really unlock the brain as a platform, but using a very ubiquitous the technology that's much more mature at this point. It's been around for a long time. We've already got it out to 140 countries. We have researchers and individuals um, you know, really all over the world. And so there's a, there's a level of maturation of this sort of non-invasive technology that allows us to get to a, we're closer to the tipping point in terms of this, where this technology can go with respect to EEG. However, um, there are limitations. There are clear limitations. You know, it's not, it's never going to be the same as having a mesh embedded in the brain. Um, you know, so 10, 20 years from now, when that technology becomes realized, um, for the people that can have access to that technology, that will be something that will be quite breathtaking. However, for the many billions of people who don't have access to that level of technological development and the price point that those technologies will come at, um, these technologies are very important to create usher in a world that allows more people to participate in neurotechnology. So we believe that, and that's why our mission and vision has always been to ensure that this technology is universally affordable. We need to drive the cost down, the accessibility down, the usability of this technology uh, into the hands of end users because, and to get it out there globally uh, in a very diverse manner so that our machine learning models are also not biased um, by you know, a very limited data set that's coming from the US, for example, or Western educated countries. Um, that's very important to us. And so you know, we, we, have a, we have a very a slightly different approach because we know that other forms of neurotech are, are also on the cusp of development and we'll get to a and this sort of inflection point around neurotechnology and neurotechnology adoption as, as a human species and what does that mean for access and inclusion for 7 billion people on this planet that all have a brain and need to have ways to 
you know, improve its resilience, to understand how we function uh, better, and then also to interface with the different environments, you know, the Internet of Things and all of the, the tools that we have available to us every day. Thank you so much, Tan. This was really uh, give a lot of insights into where we are with uh, with these uh, new technologies. I want to take now the full circle back to uh, to Rodrigo and then to uh, to Mallory and, and, and Jay and ask more for the for the human for the user side of it. So, uh, Rodrigo, is this something uh, that you actually wish for? Is this something that you would like to have to uh, in, in the middle of your life or? Uh, maybe ask differently, uh, under what circumstances uh, do you would like to have that or is it something where you even see a lot of dangers? Uh, so how do you see this? Is this, uh, do we wish for that or um, under what circumstances do we wish for it? Yes, I do, Michael, very much. Uh, because, because I think it's important to, to reinforce here that although uh, technology has aggressively advance over the last years there are there are many uh, demanded solutions that have not been created yet for example in my case if i want to uh, to to command my wheelchair uh, the only device that is is available for me so far is something like uh, uh, a, a, a device that that is put be, uh, beside my face and that I, I can with the movement of my my head uh, control the movement of my wheelchair which is very in, in my case is, is very uncomfortable i don't feel safe and 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 that that device disturbed me so it's uh, something like a joystick all the time put beside my head uh, so if if that technology we 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 are discussing here can uh, help me in this basically a uh, routing of my my life that can profoundly modify my routing so we we are we are really talking uh, about uh, something that can bring us to a new level of accessibility, uh, of autonomy, and of dignity. So, uh, we, I will, I will be uh, looking for what what comes next. And I'm glad that uh, people like Tan and people like Hazim are working for that. Thank you, uh, Rod uh, Rodrigo. Now, uh, almost for the closing words, back to you, uh, Mallory and and, and Jay. Uh, you're not so much involved in uh, in, the, in this technology and this, this usage, but you have a very broad view of uh, of, of potential users and uh, and of having heard and, and seen a lot of uh, of, of, of people. Um, what what are your takeaways from from what you uh, heard and saw today? Is it something that you see also extremely positive? Or any other takeaways? Yes, Michael, you know, well, I was in Tokyo for the 2020 Paralympic Games this summer. I had the honor of using the Toyota Accessible People Movers while we were in the village. And I will say, as an individual with paralysis, I'm much like Rodrigo, look to the world around me and realize how much technology can even the playing field as, as an individual where, you know, I've lost my ability to drive at different points due to ancillary injuries after my paralysis where I haven't been able to utilize my hand controls. And that independence that I lost in those years during that transition or simple tasks around the home. And you look at how technology, even in a time like the past two years, has brought us all together and reduces geographical barriers and brings us in as a community. And so when you look at that from the disability perspective, technology really has the power to break down barriers in a way that can increase education, can increase jobs, can create more mobility, and can really start to, as we talk about, level out that access to the human experience for individuals and the one billion people worldwide living with a disability. And I think for us, as we look to storytelling, as storytellers and producers, we get so excited to look at how can we utilize technology even in the work that we're doing? You know, we did this, this documentary virtually because 
through the pandemic and the surge, that was the safest way to do it. And so I think that's something Jay and I have have long really been interested in. And this past few years has taught us a lot about just our craft and how technology comes in, um, aside from our lifestyle with with me living with a disability and how access, how technology plays into accessibility. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think coming off of last year's conversation, Michael, you and I talked about some of the challenges with technology and storytelling. And one of the things I said that I was going to try very hard at is how to create greater accessibility within our own programming. So, you know, not only with captioning, with ASL, with with audio description. And I'm excited to share that this this documentary will be audio described and will be out within the next week. So through technology, we are creating greater accessibility for our our programming and getting our programming out to as many people as possible. And I think that's just such a an amazing entree and in, in, you know for us and everything that we're doing. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we are almost uh, at the at the finish of this uh, of these great sessions. Uh, let me just add uh, that <clears throat> for also for the Zero Project, this was not a one-off documentary, a one-off production. Uh, so we um, we will continue work, uh, hopefully also with uh, uh, and Mello and continue these great corporations and. Uh, you said you're in the storytelling business. We're also in the storytelling business. So I think there are some great things to to tell stories in a way that enlighten people, encourage them to do something, solution kind of journalism. So to to yeah, to create connections, uh, to share knowledge, uh, and I think uh, this is uh, a great way uh, to to move on with that. So we will take this experience with you and with this documentary definitely to a, a next step in the in this year. Thank you, Melody and Jay. <clears throat> thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, Tan. Uh, and, and thank you, Hasim. It was a great session, and I uh, hope we stay connected. And uh, yeah, you can um, already see this, uh, this uh, session. It's been recorded, and it, it's on demand uh, live uh, also half an hour after we recorded this now. So uh, please also share the news, share the link. Uh, I think it's definitely a session worth uh, rewatching. Thank you, and this closes this session.